Yo, yo, yo. What's up, guys? What is going on, Psych? What's up, Pinky? Dude, it did it again? It echoed again? I keep checking it, man. Like, outside of the, the video being like, I'll have to try to do some research, man. I thought it was just like a one-time thing. Apparently, it's happening again. Yo. At least three more echoes of, echoes of layer. <laughs> layers of echo. I'll have to check it again, dude. It's like every time you guys tell me it happens, I'll go back and run it. And running the video through OBS, like I usually start it up, I don't hear it, man. So, I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to figure out why all of a sudden this is happening. But thanks, man. You guys are trolls. I'm not even going to address that statement, Pinky. Get out of here. Yeah, the echo of the void. I, I mean, I don't know, dude. I don't know what's happening. I'll figure it out. It's like out of nowhere, all of a sudden, this is like an issue, and then I can't recreate it. And apparently, every time I start up the stream and actually go live, that's when it happens. So I don't know what the issue is there with uh, something between me playing the, the scene offline, it's fine, and me playing the scene whenever I'm online, I get an echo. I don't know what's going on. I'll have to figure it out. Yeah, it's definitely not echoed. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely not echoed, for sure. But I don't know, I don't know what the deal is now. So I'll have to do some research tonight and see if I can figure out what, what is causing this. It's really weird, man. But I am sorry. I'll figure it out. I don't know. I have definitely listened to it and it not echoed. So I don't know what the deal is. You guys are hearing it every time. I can't recreate it, man. <sighs> no, I, I know it. If you're hearing it on your end, I mean, I sit here and watch it sometimes and listen to it and I don't hear it on my end. So I don't know what the deal is. I'm going to have to, uh, it, it, I, I would say it, it's probably absolutely an OBS, but well, I have gone back and listened to it from the, the, uh, the vids or the VODs, uh, whenever you guys tell me, first start telling me it was happening, I've gone back and I've heard it. But whenever I watch it, like whenever I've tried to recreate the issue, I can't recreate it. You know what I'm saying? Whenever I'm trying to address it, like you guys have told me this is, has been happening, I will go back, watch the VOD, confirm that it happens, and then go back and try to recreate the issue myself through OBS with that same scene, and it won't happen. So I, I don't know. It's got to be something with it being uh, being live or, or something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to do some like live testing of it and see if I can figure out what it is. So um, I thought it was just like a wonky thing that was happening occasionally. Apparently, it's uh, in in regards to that. I mean, it it's possible, but. I don't have any other scenes that do anything like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, and I know that there have been times where it's played and it hasn't echoed. I'm just, I'm just going to have to do research. I appreciate you guys letting me know. It sucks. I'm sorry that you're getting echo on the video. I mean, it could be worse, I guess. Glass is half full. At least it plays and everything. But I'll have to go back and take a look, guys. I'm really sorry. Uh, thanks for letting me know, though. I'll, I'll take a deeper dive into it today. Um, again, the fact that I couldn't recreate it, I was just thinking, well, maybe it's just like a wonky thing that's just happening occasionally. And, uh, apparently it's not. So I'll have to go take a look. Good morning. How is everybody? It's good to see you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. Again, again, I mean, like I said, glass is half full. I mean, at least the video is playing and everything. It's just, it sucks. I don't want everybody having to deal with like an echo coming out of it. I mean, I've definitely watched it before and not not heard an echo on my side. So I don't know. There's a lot of potential things going on. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good, guys. Another beautiful day, baby. Getting to hang out with you guys. Play Valheim. Um, do the news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
I don't think we have any showcases to catch up on today, so it should just be gameplay after the news, all right? Um, we'll look and confirm, make sure there's nothing we need to catch up on, but as far as that's concerned, what the plan right now is to just do the news segment, move on to our Valheim gameplay, and uh, I don't know, we'll figure out what we're going to do this weekend as far as gameplay-wise. If we need to run Valheim into the weekend, we can. But if we finish Valheim on Friday, uh, as far as killing the last boss, then we'll move on to trying to find some community games to play on the weekend, okay? Um, let's do it. You guys ready? Hop into the news. Let's go. How are all of you doing? How are all of you? It's Wednesday, my dudes. It's Wednesday, my dudes and dudesettes. Uh... What games are, yo, Mamzelle, what's up? What games are y'all most excited for? Um, Avowed. <laughs> but I don't know anything about it because they won't release any information on it. <laughs> Keck. Lol. <laughs> Hold on, let me get this new segment up. Are you talking about like uh, just from all the showcases? Metal? Psych, you lurking, dude? All right, buddy. From the showcases, uh, we can take a quick glimpse. Um, I mean, let's let's get through the news segment, and then we'll we'll take a bit of a a. Uh, small period of time right before we start Valheim to talk about that. I mean, um, that's a really good question. It's a really good question. The thing is, I've wish listed a ton of games that I can't necessarily, necessarily remember their names. And there are some that I was really excited about that I saw that I wasn't aware of or even in development. So I need to pull up my list uh, a little bit. Ultimately, one of the things that I was looking to see that I, I got to uh, get confirmation of was Silk Song. So, yo, random out time already, guys. Oh, okay, sorry, going to the grocery run. Right on, dude. Be safe. Nice, Pinky. Nice. Ryu Champ. Um, yeah, I mean, there were some that I'm definitely... I wish listed a lot of games. There are some that looked pretty interesting to me that I'm a little hyped about. Um, a lot of the reason I wish listed games is because I, I thought that could be cool. We'll see how it, it kind of keeps progressing, you know? Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Uh, let, let me, let, let's start up this news segment real quick. Okay. And I want to address something that, um, the gamer and, and, uh, pinky were kind of talking about at, uh, in discord so uh specifically what what came up was uh gamer talking about so we'll, we'll get into the news as well but let's this is news this is this is gaming news this is uh you know specifically regarding um a ban that happened to uh Asmund gold right and uh if i Gamer, if, if I know what you're talking about and why he got, uh, or his account got suspended, right, on Twitch, you're talking about the fact where somebody in his chat put uh, a racist term and then he got banned, right? Is that what you're talking about? Was that the, uh, the situation, this most recent thing with Asmund? I'm going to start looking up articles. Let me know because what you put in discord wasn't necessarily super specific. That was the most recent ban I knew about, uh, with Asmund. And, uh, so I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. We can flesh this out and talk about it a little bit. And I will address, um, from a, the standpoint of myself as a streamer, um, how I feel about that situation and, and the way I have to address constantly my own, even as a small community right now, 
Um, but let me know if that's exactly what you're talking about. All right, here we go. PS Plus revamp gives you a ton of games, but it's a bit of a mess. Um, I linked in chat yesterday like 700 games coming along with PS Plus. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so let let's we'll address that real quick. So as far as that goes, um, and if you, I mean, he got banned initially, and then once he came out and was like uh, elaborating on his take on what happened and and what he did to kind of uh, let everybody know that that's like not acceptable and everything. So if if you're not aware, yeah, the ban was lifted early, and that's why. Right, so, so somebody and uh, and we're using this as an example. This is this stuff. This kind of stuff happens all the time from you know individuals that are either just really nasty, hate-filled people. Um, I I would say it's a combination of things. It's people that have no kind of conscience uh, regarding how their words and actions can affect other people, right? Whether it be in real life or in an online environment, what have you, which is obviously why we're trying to create this environment, this uh, nice, welcoming, um, chill, wholesome environment we have here, right? To keep away from that kind of stuff. We, we are gonna have to deal with it from the, for, for, to a certain extent, we're gonna be dealing with stuff like that as the community grows, okay? I am very, very aware of that. The more popular a streamer is, the more uh, viewers they have roll through, the more potential there is for people to come in and do things like that. And look, the fact of the matter is we have a lot of tools at our disposal to uh, try and ensure that things don't like that don't happen in our, in our streams, right? But there are always going to be ways for people to find ways to circumvent those uh tools that we use to prevent nasty hate speech, you know, whatever from, from getting into chat. Uh, it's not actually super hard. The hard thing is on our side to prevent it. And, um, specifically regarding Asmund's situation. Yeah. He stepped away for a few minutes, um, to do something from his stream. Uh, somebody blasted a, uh, racist message racist uh, piece of text in his chat and by the time he got back it had already gone through chat to where nobody could really see it anymore right um and his take on it was actually addressing everybody oh the chat was in game not on twitch itself is that what it was well yeah then there was definitely nothing he could do about it right um and so that's exactly why you said that in uh, Discord, Pinky. Yeah, and uh, look, that's why I, I try to be very... Uh, I'll give you a few examples. Pinky gave a, a great example yesterday of things that I've done, which was I always have my camera over in-game chat when we played Lost Ark, or I always tried to remember to do that. Uh, because Lost Ark... Chat, look, online chat environments are, are super just wild and, and can get pretty nasty and stuff anyways. And, and, uh, so I always tried to cover that up with my camera when we played Lost Ark. And, uh, I mean, I had a really, na a really, really bad, um, interaction with a very racist person when we were playing Nightfall, uh, not too long, a few months ago, a couple months ago. And, um, I, I mean, it was, uh, it was a matter of me trying to do everything I could to, um, report and uh, there, I mean, as an online gamer, uh, there's, there's, it's hard to get away from that stuff, you know? And, and, um, <laughs> it's again, I, I can't, all I can really do is say that it's a tough job on the part of every uh, content creator to prevent to an extent you can. And then there's always going to be ways where people find uh, the ability to circumvent your ability to prevent it. And 
really what they're looking for is a reaction, um, especially with larger streamers. They're looking for that reaction and to uh, show up on their uh, VODs and clips and stuff like that, even if it means it was uh, something they had to do that was super hate-filled and, and nasty. People are uh, weird, you know, just hungry for attention like that sometimes. And it, it's really unacceptable, you know, it really is. Um, I do everything I can to try to keep that stuff away from us because that is absolutely apart from everything that our channel and community stands for, right? Um, it's not easy. And specifically regarding Asmund Gold's situation there, I, I, I think he was right. Like, I mean, there's nothing he could do about it at that point, right? It's not like he had mods in in-game chat where they were able to uh, get rid of that stuff, right? It's, uh, again, maybe moving forward, he'll be a bit more, uh, and I don't know if it was a chat box or what, but he'll be a bit more, you know, have a bit more concerted effort at trying to hide in-game chat and stuff. I don't know, but... I, I do think he was very right in addressing it and saying that, look, it was already gone. There's nothing I could do about it. There's nothing I could do to hide it. It was already all the way through the in-game text uh, uh, chat box. Um, and he did try to address it and say, you know, don't, don't help these individuals out that are looking for this uh, attention by saying these hate-filled things. And uh, that's what they're after. Don't don't feed and don't feed the flames, as it were. Right? Uh, it's not acceptable. He 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 addressed his community, and ultimately, that's why his ban um, got lifted early. But I would say try try to take a look at it from the point of view of Twitch as well. Right? Uh, any kind of platform, the the way that they've got these very very you know set rules in place for terms of service and. If something seems like it's a violation, um, they need to take appropriate action and quick action, okay? Because look, Twitch has been blasted in the past for not taking action fast enough. So, as I always say, I'm going to err on the side of caution with most things that have to do with me in my life. Whether it be the stream or personal life, things like that. I say that that's probably what Twitch is doing as well, right? Erring on the side of caution. And if they feel like they've been presented with a situation where there is the potential for somebody to need to have their, their channel shut down while they assess uh, further what the situation kind of entailed, it's probably the best way for them to, to approach it is to just go ahead, take that channel down so they can take a bit more time to assess the situation and then see if an early unban is is you know, or if the ban was actually warranted, you know what I mean? Uh, that's one of the big things I try to get across to everybody in this community is we need to try to see things from different points of view and different, you know, wear, wear a different pair of shoes regarding these situations. And, and for Twitch, I think that they've been blasted in the past enough that they, if they see something that's a potential violation of TOS, they're going to take that channel down until they have a, uh, more time to assess the situation. Have they always been like, uh, fair in their bands and so like absolutely not there have been plenty of examples of bands happening to uh smaller streamers for a longer period of time then they the same exact kind of uh stuff would happen to a larger streamer and that larger streamer doesn't hardly face any kind of uh punishment right i mean look there, there have been issues with twitch in the past and the way that they've addressed certain issues between different kinds of uh sizable platformers and or, or broadcasters on their platform right and um i don't know they saw in my opinion they saw a situation that that appeared to be potential tos and they were trying to get ahead of the ball game so kudos to them for reassessing the situation especially after uh you know asman had a chance to get back out and be like, look, I did everything I could. I don't know what you want from me. You know, and it's, it's hard to prevent everything. It really is from a broadcaster's point of view. Oh, well, again, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I can't, you know, I can't talk to what Twitch's process was when they saw it initially and like 
How long did it take him to get his channel down? I don't know. I don't know. Um, and I only caught like a little bit of the details regarding the situation. If that's the case, you know. Uh, now, I think one of the things regarding that statement, Gamer, is uh, what made him think that? You know, what made Asman think that Twitch banned him because uh, he was all right with that word? You know what I mean? As opposed to it just being something that showed up on his channel and um, he wasn't taking maybe from Twitch's point of view uh, appropriate steps to keep things from like like that showing up on their platform, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know uh, all the details apparently, you know, and, and uh, so it's, it's a two-sided situation. I'm glad that they took another look at it and they saw Asman's point of view and they saw that he was trying to address his community in um, ensuring that everybody in his community knows that uh, hate speech and, and racist remarks, things like that, are, are not okay. And um, they saw that as an appropriate way to address that situation and unbanned, right? I think that's good. But um, again, I don't know, man. Uh, it, that's what you're saying. It was his perception of the way Twitch took it. And ultimately... Mm -hmm. uh, I just saw a clip of it, man. I've just seen a clip of it. Now, look, again, you have to understand that big streams, very big streams like Asmund's, you know, I mean, the amount of views he's getting on the regular is insane. And it doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, Asmund or XQC or uh, Miss Kiff or whoever, right? Any moderately high uh, traffic stream to especially the very very high uh traffic streams with with a large amount of viewers they are constantly being watched they are constantly being watched by uh twitch that's that is that is not something that is uh like news that that's absolutely what's going on because there is much more potential for uh, bad things to happen, right? And again, Twitch has been blown up in the past for not taking action in an appropriate amount of time, right? And in order for them, Twitch monitors me. Twitch monitors everybody that streams on their platform. But to an absolutely greater extent, they're going to be monitoring even harder and, and, and more actively for large streamers, right? So again, I think what the situation was, was uh, I can only think that it was potentially them trying to err on the side of caution and um, try to make sure that, that everything was being followed uh, according to their TOS. And, and um, honestly, it was probably one person from Twitch that caught it and was like, that's a break in TOS. The band came out, and then they had time to assess. That's what I would assume. I don't know exactly, right? I'm just trying to get people to see the different points of view that, that could potentially come across here, right? Uh, Twitch, dude, Twitch monitors everybody actively. Uh, quite often, it'll be through, like, bots and stuff like that. But there are also, especially, active Twitch uh, personnel online watching big streamers constantly. That's the way it works. So, um, it feels bad that uh, the situation played out like that where Asman was made to feel like he was um, being banned because he was okay with the term that came up in his channel. Or it wasn't his channel, in, in the game, in his stream. <coughs> but ultimately, I can't help but think that it was just potentially Twitch erring on the side of caution, you know. Um, I can see both sides of it, man. I can see both sides. But, I mean, it brings up a very important uh, issue that anybody that's a broadcaster has to deal with to an extent, uh, small or large. And, uh, I mean, we've talked about this as well, right? We've talked about the fact that there are a lot of streamers that they are not real careful. They're always kind of teetering on that line of things that would be breaking terms of service because, to an extent... Um, the things that get them in trouble are also things that create highly sought after content, right? Um, and it gets them notoriety and 
I am not that person. Uh, I enjoy being here every single day with you guys. I would never want to do anything consciously that would put the channel and our community at risk for um, us not being able to be here and spend time with each other every single day. So I can't really, I don't really, I can't relate to those streamers that really are, are trying to walk that fine line between what's okay and what's not okay on the platform, you know? And, um, all, I mean, obviously the Asmund Gold situation was not that, but we've talked about that kind of stuff a lot as well. So just kind of getting to the point of, you know, I do everything. I err on the side of caution to the greatest extent possible to ensure that I am uh, within terms of service to make sure that we don't end up in a situation in this community where uh, I'm not able to be here and hang out with you guys every single day. It's very important to me. So I don't know, man. But it's a uh, it's definitely a hot topic for sure regarding what happened and how he addressed it and didn't feel like he deserved to be banned and and uh, I appreciate you bringing it up, man. Let's get into this news. Um. Yep, we talked about that yesterday. So uh, the new PS Plus launch sees over 200 games leave the service as well. Take a look at that. Best uh, PS Plus games to play for premium and extra members. So we'll take a look at that. Well, you know, uh, the it just rolled out on the 13th, right? Uh, the the PS Plus stuff. So we're going to see a lot of articles about that right now. Um, Again, I, I wasn't real thrilled with a lot of what I saw from Microsoft's showcases this year. There were some cool things, but there were some other showcases that I thought were much better. Um, again, Devolver and uh, Day of the Devs was really good too. But let's get into this news. Let's see what's up. Team Fortress 2 fans inconsolable after PC gaming show accidentally got fans hopes up, then quickly and unceremoniously chopped them down. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I mean, what is everybody, I mean, don't be afraid to comment in chat as well. I mean, regarding your perception of that situation and, and how it might differ from the way that I took it. And uh, again, I don't have all the information. I think uh, some of you, especially like gamer, you're, you're more up to date and pinky. Yeah, yeah, I know. You guys are more up to date with what all that situation entailed, you know. I I keep track uh to an extent about what's going on on Twitch as a platform and um but I just don't necessarily always have the time to dive super deep into some of these uh hot topics, you know. So, don't be afraid to comment in regards to what my perception was and how you feel about it and things like that, for sure. Um, I'm going to dive into this. What Diablo Immortal means for the future of gaming. You know what's funny is that Blizzard's already have to come out with statements that like, don't worry, Diablo 4 is not going to be like Diablo Immortal. I'm not going to dive into this one, uh, but we will take a look at this. Uh, we're worse off without E3. Okay, let's take a look at that. And we'll, we'll uh, have a bit of discussion regarding uh, how everybody feels about that. Because obviously we don't have E3 this year. We're just seeing a bunch of uh, showcases from different developers and things like that, as opposed to you know a big production uh, comprehensive where everybody's kind of coming to the same place, right? Uh, tech slash gaming show as E3 is. Um, Newegg launches P gaming PC finder tool. We'll take a look at that. Look, I, I'm going to preface that with, uh, I used to be a big fan of Newegg 
And then Newegg sold out to a, a different company and or they were bought out by a different company. And ever since, uh, I just I have not liked Newegg nearly as much as what Newegg used to be. Um, but we'll see what what they're doing here. Um, Shantae and the Pirates Curse is free to keep on GOG. I'll pull that up. This is something to do with Gran Turismo. We're going to skim this. See what's up. Yo, uh, Sony destroyed Gran, Gran Turismo, uh, in my opinion. I've talked about it before. We'll hit it on it again when we get to that article. We've already talked about this. We hit on the uh, the new patch for Elden Ring yesterday. I'm not going to dive back into that. By the way, I was... <laughs> We've had some issues with uh, getting new segments uploaded here recently from uh, copyright strikes on some of the content um, to yesterday, the stream going down in the middle of uh, <laughs> in the middle of the news segment. But yesterday I was able to uh, get both sides of the news segment uh, put together um, and then uploaded to YouTube. So yesterday's news segment is out there. You'll definitely see where there's a cut. Uh, where it kind of fades out from yesterday's, uh, my, my PC froze up and, uh, then had to start back up and everything, but it's there guys. It's there. So again, I do apologize for what happened yesterday for everybody that was in game for Valheim and hanging out for the new segment. It felt really bad, man. I'm sorry. Uh, the importance of gaming news websites. Let's, let's read that. Or maybe even gaming news segments and streams. The importance of that. <laughs> uh, Photoshop goes free to paint on the web. Let's take a look at that. Just for content creator's sake. Uh, I'm going to pull this up. We already knew the target was doing this, but we didn't see anything in the news yesterday. What we saw was Amazon was running a buy two get one free deal because... Target started it. So I'll pull it up. I'll probably just link it in chat and let you guys take a look. But there might be something worth uh, grabbing if you're interested in grabbing some games right now. We saw this. We read that yesterday. I mean, we watched Showcase. I'm not going to dive into it. Prime Gaming Ultimate Showdown is Amazon's biggest, what, esports competition yet, I think. We'll take a look real quick. So, let me bring something up to the community real quick. Planescape Torment is not starting uh, officially until Monday. Okay, um, so this weekend, we'll run Valheim into the weekend if we need to. Otherwise, let's figure out some games to play, okay, this weekend. Uh, see if we can find some community games to mess around with. Uh, Roller Champions felt real bad last weekend, so I stopped playing it and just went and tried out Valheim. Or not Valheim, but uh, Vampire Survivors for a little bit and... Uh, it was good to get back into some Vampire Survivors, but I'd rather find some content that we can play together, some games we can play together. Uh, so let me know if you have ideas. We've already talked about a few games previously, and um, let's just let's. I already have Among Us installed. I've never played it. <laughs> it's a that's a potential thing for us to try out. Um, we've talked about some different things, but let me know what your ideas are for what we should do this weekend as far as content. Okay. I would like to do some some games where community can get in and we can play together and stuff. We talked about these yesterday. Um, these actually sound like a pretty good product, especially for people that um, can't always wear headphones. I, I have an issue wearing headphones all the time because I deal with some headaches and uh, from time to time and wearing my headset can make it worse. So a really nice set of um, 
wireless earbuds could could be a big deal and HyperX is known for making really quality products. Be prepared to spend about $150 on these things. Goose Goose Duck is free. Okay. Let me put that on my list real quick and we'll bring it up after the uh the new segment, okay? Thank you. Similar to Among Us? Okay. Thanks, Mamzo. Thank you. You guys are going to obliterate me in any game like that because I literally have not jumped into any of that stuff. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Mamzo. Uh, this is just talking about the the new PlayStation Plus subscription, which we're already well aware of. So I'm not going to dive into that. Yeah, this is basically, uh, if you didn't catch this in our previous news segments, Microsoft, their Edge browser has this uh, clarity booster uh, tech that's been incorporated to it now where it's supposed to make any kind of Microsoft uh, cloud gaming um, play smoother, look better, stuff like that. So, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> well, then you don't get to play. But thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> All right, let's switch up our, our search here real quick. What? Little League World Series Baseball 2022 brings the tournament. An arcade baseball game coming to consoles and PC this August. We'll resurrect Little League World Series. Cool, man. Let's take a look. What has happened to all the video games? As the industry braced itself for a quiet 2022 and with more major games getting delayed, we asked developers about the challenges. Uh, let's take a look at that. <laughs> you shouldn't have told me that, Mamzelle. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just kidding. You'll definitely play. Yeah, here's that Amazon deal we saw yesterday. Um... If you're interested, go. It's not just games either. There's like the new Batman movie. There's all kinds of stuff on there that will uh, uh, work for the buy two get one free sale they have. So go take a look if you're interested. We already have another article up about what uh, Diablo Immortals pay to win monetization stuff means. So I'm not going to dive into this one, but. Hollow Knight. So, uh, to to partly answer your question, Metal, um, I was super excited to see that we're going to get tentatively Hollow Knight within the next year. To do it? Oh well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, man. So, so this was one of uh, you know before we even got into the showcases over the past week. Two of my big asks were to see some Hollow Knight and Avowed. And I got one of those. Um, so, glasses half full. We'll, we'll talk about, again, between, um, between the news segment and going in and playing Valheim, we'll take a bit of time to talk about uh, what everybody saw and they're maybe a little bit hyped about regarding uh, content that was shown from the uh, the showcases, as well as uh, maybe a little bit more talk about uh, what we want to play this weekend and um, that kind of stuff, okay?
why every big game looks the same. <laughs> We're talking about this. The Grammys are actually giving out an award for best uh, video game composition, which is really cool. Psych, what's up, bro? Um, Silent Hill movie director says video game reboot is happening. I'm going to pull this up. We probably will just skim it because we already knew the reboot was happening. Um, I mean, if you guys didn't see it, I already kind of confirmed, uh, that the reboot was happening. Okay. If you didn't see on my Twitter, there's your confirmation that, uh, New Silent Hill reboot is happening, okay, guys? It definitely looks like a little bit of a, a spinoff from the traditional, but um, very delicious nonetheless. <laughs> Tell me that's not great. <laughs> this guy is my hero. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what a crusty joke. Uh sorry, man. I thought I thought it worked. I thought it worked. But I mean, we actually had already seen uh previously, like I've already pulled this up. We're going to take a look at it, but in all honesty, we had already seen that um there had been leaked images and uh I think it was just images for the most part. Got leaked on Twitter, and Konami came in right away and had them DMCA'd. Uh, they did not want that content out, and that was a pretty good indication that there's a for sure Silent Hill in the works, and maybe not even too far away at this point. But uh, time frame wise, we're not sure. We'll just see. But uh, it's already been kind of. Like unofficially confirmed that Silent Hill, uh, new Silent Hill game is coming. But we'll take a look. <laughs> we already got that up. We already know that uh, Ragnarok, God of War Ragnarok, slated for November launch. We've got that article up. <laughs> Cap it, dude. Yo, this is actually really cool, man. Um, so we we had been talking here here recently. It was nice to see Valheim. It was nice to see Valheim in the uh, the showcase. Uh, <laughs> said cheesy, there, yeah. Um, and we had had people coming in recently to the streams, the Valheim streams, and asking like, "Is this console only?" And it was like, "Well, no." Or, or is this on console? And it was like, "Well, no. It's just on uh, PC right now." You know and and now there you have it, dude. It's actually coming to Xbox consoles and Game Pass. So uh, Valheim making moves, dude. And look, the more people that can kind of get their hands on Valheim and, and play this game, the better. Um, I don't know if I see it playing as well on a console as I do on PC, but um, I, I'm sure it'll be fine. And uh, they've got new content update coming. And good for Valheim devs, man. Uh, obviously, this game is loved. Loved. But it's only been in the, the PC community, right? Uh, so um, it's only appropriate that a title like this moves over to uh, other platforms so other people that... Maybe don't play PC games, can get a taste, because this game's amazing. New Bleach game could be revealed soon. Take a look real quick. 
All right, last page. Reddit, Reddit. This is about uh, Ark 2. Yeah, we got Vin Diesel up in there riding dinos. Full throttle. Yo, Fat Pat, what's up, buddy? A thin, crusty joke. <laughs> Fat Pat, what's up, dude? How are you, man? Yeah, we've talked about a lot of these already. It's good. We got a lot of news articles already this morning, so. Um. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm doing great, buddy. Thanks for asking, yeah. Doing, doing very, very well, man. Loving life. Enjoying the summer, dude. Uh, been trying to get back into a little bit of shape, dude. Getting some workouts in about every other day, man. I, I, I definitely hibernated this winter. I didn't do anything, dude, but get fat. So trying to at least get in a little bit better shape, man. Going to the pool about every two or three days, man. Uh, feels good. Yeah. Okay, psych. Okay. Um, so, psych, that's actually really neat. What I might do is save that for, because once we end up uh, finishing up Valheim, we're going to take a look at uh, Valheim content. We're going to take a bit of time, like a couple hours or so, and probably just look up Valheim content um, as far as like seeing some of the wild builds people have done. Um, we could take a look at stuff like that, like uh, some of the cooler mods that have been done for the game, because we're just playing it vanilla, or I am anyways, right? And um, That's what I might save that and uh, take a look at that whenever we do this uh, this look at like other Valheim content and stuff after we finish the game. Because, you know, I like to do that with specific games. Like, we did it with Dark Souls, because Dark Souls 1, such a great game for so many people to uh, get into speedrunning with, and so we watched a bunch of, like, speedrun games, or... Uh, vids, stuff like that, but I might save that for our, our post Valheim gameplay Valheim content look. Okay. But that's awesome, dude. That looks really neat. That looks wild. I had heard, uh, who was telling me that that was actually uh, a thing being made? Somebody was telling me that. Well, yeah, I see what it is. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, that's not the first time a game uh, has come out with a VR mod that completely changes everything. Even uh, we read recently, the most recent example I can talk, uh, talk about is Witcher 3. <clears throat> Witcher 3 actually has a VR mod that was made by the community. And um, every single part of Witcher 3 that has you playing as Geralt, uh, it allows you to play in uh, first-person mode right so kind of the same thing like you could throw in some vr and uh, it's not necessarily specifically made for vr but they, it allows you to play in first person which completely changes the way uh you know you you address approaching gameplay and stuff yeah and it's really wild what people are able to do with that so uh i appreciate it man we'll uh yeah we'll take a look at it for sure probably not today but with the valheim content stuff as we finish up Okay, let's get into these articles. Let's get into these. Um, new Bleach game could be revealed soon. Any Bleach fans out there? Uh, a new Bleach game could be revealed soon. Unfortunately, this is about the extent of insight we currently have. Speculation is making the rounds as a result of some comments from Bleach creator Taikubo, who seemingly teased a new Bleach console game when re it returns with the Thousand Year Blood War arc. When Kubo was asked about a new Bleach console game, Kubo said that uh, Kubo said that feels like he heard something about a new console game from someone who would know. Obviously, this is all vague, but there's no reason to expect Kubo was given the wrong impression or information. Uh, if a new Bleach console game is in the works, it's likely in the works at Bandai Namco, as it handles most video game adaptations of popular anime. Some of these games have been quite good, while others have been quite middling. Last time Bleach was on a console was via Jump Force, which you can't get on Steam anymore. And it was represented with a character in the game, yeah. Yep, so uh, that's about it. No real details, but potential confirmation there that a new Bleach game is coming. Cool. Yeah, and, and there have been a lot of other games, too, that have incorporated VR after the fact. You know, uh, VR 
mods and and uh, like Skyrim's got VR, you know, and and uh, there are a lot of games that have done a pretty good job at incorporating VR after the fact uh, of the games being released and stuff like that. But particularly, I would say that like Valheim is a bit different because you're not even really playing in like a. It would it would drastically change things drastically, um, which anytime you take a game that's not first person and turn it into like go straight into VR with it, you know it's going to be quite a different experience. But that's really neat. I had heard they were doing that for Valheim, and that's cool, buddy. Um, new PS Plus launch sees over two hundred games leave the service. Yeah. Um, Sony finally launched its ambitious PS Plus revamp in North America, giving more gamers the chance to check out the new subscription tiers and everything they have to offer. For those who may not have been following along, um, <laughs> I mean, is that a change from regular Valheim? <laughs> Let's just get this straight, dude. All right. Um, Sony has made some big changes to PlayStation Plus in an effort to compete more directly with Microsoft's Xbox Game Pass subscription service. Yes. The jury is still out on whether Sony's efforts will be successful or not, but the revamp has already suffered a big blow. The new PS Plus tiers give PS4 and 5 gamers three options to choose from. Yeah, three different tiers. Uh, PS Plus Essential is Vanilla PS Plus, giving players access to monthly free games, various discounts on the PlayStation Store, and online multiplayer. PS Plus Extra, the mid-tier, is the next step up, essentially combining the existing PlayStation uh, Now service with PS Plus and adding some newer, higher-profile games into the mix. Top tier, PS Plus Premium, is the priciest tier, and it gives users access to retro games, some of which come with enhancements to improve the experience for modern games. Gamers. <laughs> All right, gamer. Yo, uh, cool, man. White Knight Chronicles. Huh? I don't think I'm familiar with that title. Uh, all right, well, you have to let me know what you think about it. And again, you know, as you continue to try out the new PS Plus stuff, man, let me know how you feel about it, yeah? Uh, if you're heading to work, buddy, have a great day. Uh, be safe, okay? Thanks for being here, man. We'll see you soon. Uh, a list was compiled by PSN Profiles user uh, Starvar. Of the over 200 games that are on their way out. I'm not going to read all these. But it's a lot, guys. Um, if you're potentially interested in PS Plus, look. They also have, I, I listed yesterday, 700 games that are being added. Uh, or, or that are part of the new PS Plus subscription. But there's 200 that are leaving as well. So, if you have PS Plus, if you are interested in PS Plus subscription... Uh, that might be something, you know, this might be something you're interested in taking a look. I'm not going to read all 200 of these guys. I'm sorry. But if you're interested, it's linked there in chat. There's a lot of games, uh, that are being taken off and it might be good for you to have a, a nice look at what's being taken off the, the, the subscription service, you know, to begin with here. Best new PS plus games to play now for premium and extra members. Um, so just a, a quick summary of what you will have to pay here for those, uh, subscription tiers. We'll have roundups covering the highlights that are exclusive to PS plus premium members later this week. Uh, right now, PS plus extra costs 15 a month or a hundred a year while premium is 18 a month or 120 a year. Um, uh, some of the more notable from this article are Ashen. Batman Arkham Knight, Bloodborne, for all you Soulsborne fans, Celeste, great, it's supposed to be a great game, I haven't played it, but I, I want to very badly, Control Ultimate Edition, Dead Cells, fantastic roguelike game, I haven't played it in, uh, since pretty early in Access, but what I played of it was so much fun, uh, they've added a lot of content since I played it though. It's like a uh, side-scrolling roguelite uh, platformer, really cool, man. Really cool. Death Stranding, Demon Souls remake, Doom, Final Fantasy series. There's no shortage of Final Fantasy in the new PS Plus. If you're spoiled for choice, uh, as you're spoiled for choice with remastered PS1 games, Final Fantasy X uh, and X2, 
Final Fantasy 15 and more. Okay. Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut. It's supposed to be a fantastic game that I haven't played as well. Ghost Runner it looks amazing. God of War was sick. Uh, this game was so much fun, man. Can't wait for Ragnarok. Gravity Rush 2. Hollow Knight Void Heart Edition. Yo, one of my favorite games of all time. Hollow Knight, so good. Uh, second favorite Metroidvania of all time behind Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Um, such a great game. Horizon Zero Dawn Complete Edition, another game I need to play. Uh, Hotline Miami 2, Marvel Spider-Man and Miles Morales, Mortal Kombat 11, Nidhogg 1 and 2, Outer Wilds, another game that's supposed to be just absolutely fantastic. Overcooked 2, Red Dead Redemption 2, uh, Rishigun, Returnal, Returnal, man, that's another one I need to play. Uh, Res Infinite, Shadow of the Colossus, sick game, dude. Uh, this is going to be the remake, too, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, Shadow of the Colossus, a, a uh, defining game in video game history, and the remake... I haven't played the remake, but the original was amazing, so I can only assume that the remake was really good, too. Uh, Tetris Effect Connected, Tearaway Unfolded, Uncharted 4, and Lost Legacy, uh, XCOM 2. There you go, man. Uh, that's that's uh, some pretty nice, notable titles there uh, for the PS Plus subscription uh, moving forward. Nice, nice. Here you go. Team Fortress 2 fans inconsolable after PC Gaming Show snub. Uh, the PC Gaming Show accidentally got fans' hopes up, hopes up, then quickly and unceremoniously chopped them down. Like a tree in Valheim. Uh, some poor t Team Fortress 2 players, beleaguered by bots, stomachs growling from the game's lack of major updates, wrongly believed they would finally get a dose of good news after spotting the engineering character in a promotional image for PC Gamer's PC Gaming Show on June 12th. They did not. To be fair to PC Gamer's graphic designer, the promotional image also featured characters like uh, Manny Calavera from the adventure game Grim Fandango, which was released in 1998, the Red Prince from role-playing game Divinity Original Sin 2, and Laura Croft from the Angelina Jolie movie. Really? This is how Laura Croft gets referred to as a character from an Angelina Jolie movie. As opposed to Laura Croft from the like massive, massively popular series of Tomb Raider. That's really weird. That is really weird, man. What the crap is that? Somebody's got an Angelina Jolie uh thing. Yeah, who's the writer of this? Ashley Barden has a yum for Angelina Jolie, apparently. What a weird uh pivot there. Talk about all these characters from the games they're from, and then go Laura Croft from uh the Angelina Jolie movie, which isn't even named. <laughs> what? And Laura Croft was from Tomb Raider way before Tomb Raider was even made into a movie. I don't, I don't understand writers sometimes. I'm constantly like just thrown off by some of the stuff they put in these articles. We can assume that gamers in 2022 aren't frothing at the mouth for a Grim Fandango remaster just in time for his 24th birthday. But Team Fortress 2 players, Wick, what's up, dude? Uh, would gladly accept the most microscopic crumb of news to keep them fed. They've had a hard few years. Video game company Valve has put the 15-year-old game mostly on the back burner aside from lifeless Halloween-themed updates. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I always read things wrong, too. So. <laughs> Team Fortress 2 players once kept, just because I can't speak English, you know, uh, once kept track of their neglect on the website creators. Uh, TF, with a graphic indication indicating days since the game's last major update. To fill the empty days, they also maintained a repository of fan-made updates to keep the, quote, authentic Team Fortress 2 spirit alive and to the rise 
and to rise to the occasion when Valve wouldn't. That website is down now. Uh, spotting the engineer out in the wild was thrilling for the sad puppy, seeing him prove that other people could see him too, and that they remember Team Fortress 2's existence. A normal promotional image turned into a single hopeful firefly in the game's starless update, Catacombs. But once players' uh, hope grew too big, PC Gamer stamped out that firefly real quick. Quote, just to check everyone's collective expectations, this is a promotional image celebrating some iconic characters in PC Gaming. The website tweeted on June 12th. Uh, Team Fortress 2 isn't featured in this year's show as much as we'd like it to be. Ah, can you hear that? It's the sound of 30,000 hearts getting bazooka gun. It was funny how Team Fortress 2 fans collectively deflated, even though context clues might have saved them from the dis their disappointment. They also knew their intense reaction was funny, posted a lot of memes that involved crying and laughing and laughing about how much they were crying. Uh, can't fault them for their tears. They flow because mainstream gaming showcases have trained players' expectations to grow big and tall, despite the fact that the announcements they share are often demure, predictable, or not at all what players were asking for. Yo, it happened to me this year. It happened to me this year. Um, we were hoping to see a vowed. Then articles were coming out going, we're going to see a vowed from Obsidian. We're going to see a vowed. You know, it was like some credible stuff coming out saying prepare to get some, some new stuff from about nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> I try not to get too hyped about stuff like that, but uh, do we've been looking for a vow for a long time. So I I'm in this boat right now. I got we, uh, super deflated, man. Felt real bad. Uh, Yeah, of course fans are getting, going to be disappointed. They've all been eaten by the hype monster gaming showcases created. The one the industry is realizing it can no longer control. We should defame the monster once and for all. Wipe your tears. Keep your expectations modest. Don't trust people who want to sell you things. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't get I don't get super hyped about stuff most of the time in regards to like gaming announcements and stuff like that. But dude, I was really, really hopeful that we would get some new avowed stuff. It's been over it's been like Coming on two years since we got the first trailer for, for Avowed, and we've seen nothing. Uh, I mean, at least we got some, uh, again, Silk Song stuff for Hollow Knight sequel. So glass is half full. But and I saw a lot of other cool stuff. We're gonna we're gonna take a look at my wish list. Uh, we don't. I don't think we have any more showcases to really deal with for the rest of this month. And uh, I'm gonna take a look at my wish list and uh, real quick in between news and hitting Valheim. So we can take a look at everything I threw on there from the showcases. Uh, what Diablo Immortal means for the future of gaming. Diablo Immortal has been sitting, uh, setting the internet alight with controversy. Every gaming website under the sun has a take about how the microtransactions ruin the gameplay. And how Blizzard was running, ruining fans' beloved childhood memories of Diablo. <laughs> The game currently holds the lowest user score on Metacritic. Uh, still more Diablo fans feel like this just isn't a game designed for them. And they might be right. <laughs> Despite its mobile origins, Immortal grew wax wings and flew too close to the PC gaming sun. For a loyal audience uh, to whom Blizzard had pandered for years, that was considered unforgivable. I get it. The monetization criticisms hold water, but the prospect of overspending isn't always the actual reason why console gamers are so upset. True simpler. Mobile represents another front in the never-ending culture war for the heart and soul of gaming. But I have to question if it has to be a war at all. Before Immortal was announced, Diablo fans could safely ignore mobile games as cash grabs, quote, that would never affect the premium games that they wanted to play. But ever since Blizzard announced that the game would be a full Diablo experience, these gamers have felt threatened by what they perceive as mobile's encroachment on legitimate gaming. In fact, the game raised so many concerns that Blizzard's community manager had to clarify that Diablo 4 would not have mobile-style monetization. But it wasn't enough for Blizzard to make promises to the fans. I don't even like saying their name anymore, man. It just tastes so bad. The press was also expected to fall in line with Immortal is bad. On June 4th, there was an incendiary tweet from a Twitch streamer that lambasted journalists for saying that Diablo Immortal is, well, fun. 
I've already hit on this. This is a tried and true gimmick for pay to win, pay to play types of games, especially in the mobile realm. Um, you start off with the gameplay, not feeling like it's pay to win or pay to play. Have a good, good, good elements of gameplay development, right? Where um, it kind of keeps people wanting to play the game. Then in the middle of it, you start getting into that, oh, well, if you want to progress, you're going to need to give us a little bit of that cash, you know? And, and um, so I addressed this earlier. <laughs> Psych. I almost said it too, Psych. I'm so three-head, dude. Nice. Nice, dude. Um, but that's that's the gimmick behind a lot of this, right? I mean, it's not that they're not well-developed. It's not that they're not fun to play. Um, it's ultimately, a, a, at the heart of what it is, is that it just it feels incredibly bad that they, they try to suck people into the game to go, well, I've already spent this much time playing the game and it's been fun. I'll just pay a little bit now. And then to progress later, I'll just pay a little bit more. And with Diablo Immortal, it wasn't a little bit, dude. It's a lot of money you have to pay to progress in this game. I was unsurprised because I was met with similar public hostility when I started writing about Genshin Impact. If a journalist is too positive about a mobile game, then a very vocal segment of gamers will decry them as a traitor to gaming and a corporate sh uh, shill. To these players, the rise of F2 pay, uh, free-to-play gaming is a virus that needs to be stamped out, especially before it takes over gaming at large. Uh, we've we've talked a lot about uh, you know ways that games have been free to play and have incorporated uh, the way for them to make money off those free to, free to play games in a very uh, gamer friendly way. And then there are the uh, you know like Path of Exile, for example. Then you get uh, the exact opposite, which is free to play games that do it in an absolutely terribly scummy uh, kind of way, like Diablo Diablo Immortal has. Uh, despite all the background noise, or maybe because of it, I felt compelled to download Diablo Immortal and play for a bit. Um, I get it now. The villains might be monstrous demons from hell, but their designs are killer. The voice acting is superb. I grew attached to the side characters I met along the way. Always had the impression that Diablo is an edgelord game, but Immortal is full of heart. Every character in the game was willing to make steep personal sacrifices because they wanted to fight against the suffering that hell inflicted on innocent people. What's not to love about that? All of these factors likely played a huge part of why Diablo Immortal has 10 million downloads despite a .2 user score on Metacritic. Huge disconnect between internet commenters who consider themselves the stewards of gaming and the actual audiences who enjoy playing Diablo as a free-to-play game. Yeah, I'm not going to read the, the rest of this, really. I'll, I'll summarize it here. Uh, there absolutely needs to be a lot of discussion about the more predatory aspects of mobile gaming. This can't take place entirely from the perspective of a diehard group of lifelong Diablo fans being angry that their favorite franchise has reached out to another audience. 10 million people downloaded the game because they wanted to. And while protecting the most vulnerable among their uh, number is an admirable goal, it's perhaps not always the genuine reason for the outcry. Um, look, there's reason why Diablo Immortal, there's the rest of the, you know, there's the article in chat if you want to read the rest of it. There are a lot of valid points that are brought up there, but there's also, I mean... Ultimately, what Diablo Immortal does is quite often looked at as gambling in a game. Um, you know, and there are, we've had this discussion a lot. I'm not going to dive into this very deep, but there's a reason why countries have already banned the game. It was not even allowed to release in the Netherlands or uh, Belgium, right? I think those were the two places. And there are all kinds of other companies or companies, countries that are, coming um, together to kind of say, look, this stuff is not good for our citizens. Um, 
it's very uh, an a very addictive um predatory scummy kind of incorporation within video games that um caters to people that have a, a problem with gambling and um impressionable young people uh try to suck them into these kinds of gimmicks right so we've talked about before whether it's a an infringement on people's ability to spend money the way they want or if it's actually a, a very predatory kind of incorporation for games that needs to be addressed by governments, right? Um, right, yeah, yeah, specifically, Psych. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, you're right. I mean, that's what I was getting at, mm-hmm. Yep. But, yes, that's why they have laws in place. Some of these countries have laws in place. You say uh, they have laws in place already that um, don't allow any of those kinds of mechanics, uh, game mechanics, to be allowed within their countries, right? And um, there are other countries like Spain, we've seen uh, in articles, that are coming together. I think they've got like this whole like group of like 18 nations at this point, countries that are uh, kind of fighting back against these uh, these mechanics, you know, and, and are trying to get on board with, you know, the way the Netherlands and Belgium are have already incorporated laws. Yeah, and there's been an outcry for the U.S. to uh, start taking a hard look at uh, regulating this kind of stuff as well. So, I don't know. Some people are going to feel like they're being kept from spending money the way they want to. And uh, on the flip side of it, it's... Um, government organizations uh, trying to ensure that their citizens aren't being preyed upon, right? It's a tough thing to, to really address. Uh, there are different viewpoints on it. But I will say that I think Diablo Immortals incorporation of these mechanics is some of the scummiest I've seen in a long time. Um... We're worse off without E3. Let's see what this has to say. A recent topic of discussion in the PC Gamer offices mirrored a more general sense of confusion among the gaming crowd and industry. What do we call this summer game showcase period where there's no E3? We've mostly plumped uh, for not E3 through social media, has come up with his own uh, Key 3 re replacement, referring to um, Jeff Keighley, right? Summer Games Fest host, uh, uh, you know, so Key 3. Common element there being the number, which of course comes from the three words themselves, Ele Electronic Entertainment Expo. E3 was always gaming showpiece beginning in 95 and held at the Los Angeles Convention Center for decades to come. This isn't about a potted history of the event, which was brought to a screeching halt in 2020 by the COVID pandemic and hasn't been held in person since so much as what has replaced it and what's missing. You can't say that we didn't get a lot of games during not E3 2022, uh, including megatons like the first look at Starfield bleh, and the full list of absolutely dizzying. And the full list is absolutely dizzying. I, yeah. So reading well, right guys? Yeah. The number of events held over the period June 2nd to 13th is also kind of staggering, though obviously some are bigger than others. Sony State of Play, Summer Game Fest, Devolver Digital, which was great, Netflix Geek Week, which we need to summarize uh, when we don't have a super long news segment, uh, Epic Game Showcase, Tribeca Games, Guerrilla Collective, Wholesome Direct, Future Game Show, um, Xbox and Bethesda, and our own PC Gaming Show. PC Gaming Show was good. I felt. PC Gaming Show was pretty good. Um, yeah. The industry is bigger than ever before. And that means there's more games than ever before. Even if in the post-COVID era, many of the bigger titles in uh, particular are suffering delays. All the shows above boasted dozens, many of them exclusive. There's an absolute surfeit of gaming riches to be had. Yeah, the reaction didn't seem uh, there.
For want of a better catch-all term, at no point during this E3 period did it feel like the hype train was about to take off from the tracks. It's a long one. Uh, we have a lot of news to get through, so uh, I'm just going to summarize this. I'll put it in chat so you guys can read all of it, okay? There it is. I'm going to summarize this, though, with the, the end here. E3 2023. Look, they've already come out and said that E3 2023 is for sure happening. But the fact that E3 has been basically non-existent for the past two years, I think has people very uh, not holding their breath for E3 coming back. And even if it does, it might not be the same E3 that people used to know. The lack of excitement around this year's not E3 comes down for me to the disparate uh, sh scattergun of shows over a longer period, the lack of concentrated focus on everyone all at once, and the personality-led nature of E3's most obvious replacement. I don't, uh, I don't have any issue with Jeff Keighley, but I also think the industry is too big to tie itself to this kind of self-congratulatory talk show format. Problem being that uh, the ESA is a crap show. The Entertainment Software Association runs E3, and while every big event company has gone through a business crisis over recent years, E3 has been handled especially bad. I'd particularly flag the will-they-won't-they they manner in which the ESA has said that E3 would return this year and last year, and the well-founded uncertainty this created. Can't blame Keeley and others for stepping in, nor the industry that wants a global showcase, when it doesn't look like the organizers of E3 know what they're doing. Games is now one of the world's largest creative industries, a space where so many exciting things are happening all at once that it's hard to keep track at the best of times. The industry shouldn't shy away from having its moment in the sun, but an 11-day spread can only ever fill a... Uh, I don't know what that word is. And diffuse. Uh, what does that mean? Inquit? Inquit? Is that what... Yeah, I'm, I am not familiar with this word. Inquit. Let's hear this. Let me hear this. Inchoate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, inchoate. The more you know, chat, learning. Just begun and, and so not fully formed or developed. Rudimentary. Inchoate. Hmm. Okay. New word. We're worse off without E3 and the industry will seem more like a more exciting place if it can somehow pull off its promised 2023 comeback. Yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, English is my first language, man, and I, I had never, uh, never heard that word. So, I don't know. But I'm an English pleb, right? So, <laughs> as my first language, uh, as my only language I speak, I'm an English pleb. <laughs> I guarantee you my mom would know it. I bet my wife, my, my, I guarantee my wife would know it too. I don't know. Um... Newegg launches gaming PC finder tool, but is it fair or foul? Uh, popular online tech retailer Newegg has launched a new shopping tool designed to simplify gaming PC choices for customers. The new gaming PC finder asks you to pick up four titles from a selection of 18. Then you choose the monitor resolution at which you would like to play. Clicking view results presents a list of pre-built PCs with the top two choices highlighted as below. Uh, the above two PCs are based on our choosing a selection of fast-paced and competitive esports titles and a target 1080p monitor. You can see the starter choice offers up to 285 frames per second in the games chosen and is based on the combined processing power of the uh, Intel i5-12400F and a uh, RTX 3060. This ABS Gaming Master PC is priced at $1,200 US but might be over specced and expensive if your monitor is limited to 144 hertz, for example. Newegg's so-called mainstream choice for the selection of esports titles looks a lot more like upselling. The choice provides up to 384 frames per second in the target games and resolution, based on an Intel Core i7-12700F and an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3070. This should be a capable machine for most almost all titles. 
not just esports, using a fully high def monitor. Unfortunately, it isn't a minor step up in price either. At twenty one hundred, this MSI gaming desktop is approaching double the cost of the starter choice. Um, upselling or future proofing. Some esports gamers will already have or intend to purchase a fast refresh rate monitor, making these desktop choices more sensible. However, it is probably more accurate to characterize the Newegg gaming PC finder tool with its mainstream selection as upselling rather than future proofing. Running these esports titles at 1080p will be satisfactory on an RTX 3060 for the foreseeable future. However, the beauty of PCs is that you can upgrade any slow component in a couple of years to re app very appealing gains. Uh, the new esports recommendations were somewhat questionable, particularly uh, with those looking to spend a minim minimum amount of money. So we thought we'd have another shot at the gaming PC finder tool and select just one graphically demanding modern action RPG game at a target resolution at 1440p. Uh, they chose Cyberpunk 2077 and select 1440p. That's it. That's all they selected. With this kind of game, players don't typically aim for frame rates much higher. <laughs> Speak for yourself, buddy. Uh, higher than 60 or 70 frames. Thus, Newegg's starter choice here seems smart. Choosing an older gen hex core CPU, putting more of the budget into the GPU, a 3060 Ti. This $1,200 desktop PC is claimed to hit up to 50 frames in Cyberpunk at 1440p. Wait, what? They're saying you're only going to hit 50 frames at 1440p on a 3060 Ti? Yo, Fat Pat. Yeah, exactly, dude. Like what I was just saying, dude, you put in chat. Hold on. I think even at Ultra, you would get more than that. Yo, I'm rocking a 3070. I'm rocking a 3070, and I can play most games, at, even like graphically intensive games, uh, 3060 Ti or, or, or 3070 on like Ultra, way above 50, dude. Where's our, uh, does this actually show different, uh, oh my gosh, that's all they're giving me, dude. Hold on. Try a different search here real quick. Uh, 3060 Ti, uh, 1440 key yes benchmarks let's take a look at this <clears throat> tom's hardware is pretty good uh stepping up to a 1440p there's not a huge change in rankings but the difference between the various gpus becomes a bit more pronounced that's because CPU bottlenecks are largely gone at 1440p, except perhaps for the absolute fastest, uh, like a 3090, yeah. Uh, this is a nine-game average, 1440p, ultra settings, right? And the 3060 Ti is hitting an average of 110 frames per second. The lowest it's showing is 83 frames. 
across a nine-game average. Uh, Borderlands 3, Division 2, Far Cry 5. Where's Far Cry 5 at? 3060 Ti, 118 frames on Ultra. Average. At 1440p Ultra settings. Forza 4. Um, 156 frames average. Borderlands 3? Borderlands 3 would probably be most comparable to Cyberpunk. Um, and it was uh, 74 frames average. Is Cyberpunk that more... Is it really only going to hit 50 in Cyberpunk? I'm really uh sorry I I've I've got to I've got to take a, a look at this. <laughs> yeah yeah so here's just something from reddit back in uh december of 2020 right and this is literally from somebody just that has has uh got a 3060 ti playing at 1440p on cyberpunk 2077 this person averaged 60 to 70 frames, all settings cranked to the max with ray tracing and DLSS at 1440p. If I play with DLS, DLSS running, the quality... And now, remember, dude, Cyberpunk was a hot mess when it came out, too. So, uh, quality, my frames dropped to 35 to 45 range. If I, 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 and uh, I can't tell the difference between visually between having DLSS quality and DLSS per preference turned on. So I think performance is the way to go. So I think 50 was a little bit low there. Um, ultra settings, 60 to 70 seems about more appropriate than like, I was, I would have been really surprised to see that hit below. 60 frames so um i think that might have been a bit of a an undershot there um new eggs mainstream choice doesn't go overboard targeting 65 frames but costs a lot more i mean i guess what they're saying here is like i guess to undershoot rather than overshoot right is the thing for them to do um so saying you're now, what, what did they say? Did they say at the best you're going to get 50 frames? Up to 50 frames. Yeah, I, I find that weird. I find that weird. Uh, Newegg's mainstream choice doesn't go overboard. Targeting 65 frames per second, but costs a lot more at 19, uh, roughly 2,000 US. Uh, in our own tests of... <laughs> Wait, Really? In our own tests of Cyberpunk 2077 at 1440p Ultra, we found that the above recommended starter GPU of the 3060 Ti could hit 52 frames per second on average. Really? Well, yeah, but I mean, we were specifically talking about Ultra, right? 52 frames, or 50 frames tops? 50 frames tops seemed like uh, kind of an undercut there. Uh... I know the Cyberpunk's a very graphically intensive game, but I felt it just seemed to me, for everything that I know about the hardware, it should have been a bit above that. 
Moreover, if you want to enable ray tracing and apply DLSS with the balanced profile, you could achieve over 48 frames on average with the same GPU. With this in mind, the new age starter and mainstream choices for Cyberpunk 2077 seem reasonable. However, with a bit of thought and reading through Tom's hardware reviews and guides, a PC, PC enthusiast or DIYer could spend their money more wisely, especially at the higher end. Okay, I mean, maybe it's not that far, but I think this is a, a weird thing to stay up to 50 frames. When it seems like, and I don't, I don't know, they tested it. They tested it at Ultra on, on Cyberpunk and got 52 average. Okay. I really figured it would hit more than that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely expect a game like Apex. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what I was getting ready to say is I definitely expect a game like Apex to hit uh, frames, uh, high, much higher frames easier than a game like Cyberpunk. Um, that's why I, I was like, before we even saw any of the Cyberpunk numbers, uh, I was kind of saying that the Cyber or the, uh, the Bi Borderlands 3 stats uh, were going to be a bit more comparable, but still a little bit higher than what Cyberpunk would probably pull uh, on Ultra. So, um, I just figured a 3060 Ti still would be able to press a little bit higher than uh, 50 frames average, but apparently not. That's news to me. Mm. Okay. Not that that's like terrible or anything, but yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, the more you know, man. That's why we research. Um, here you go, guys. Shantae and the Pirate's Curse is free to keep... Hey, Timon, what's up, buddy? Uh, personal preference, you know? Um, I will say that I loved um, Borderlands 1. I adored Borderlands 2. Um, the pre-sequel couldn't hold my attention. I ended up playing probably about 30 hours and then just dropped it. Um, I haven't played Borderlands 3 yet. And I haven't played uh, Tiny Tina's Wonderland yet either. But, um, again, not every game is for everybody. We have, all the time we have conversations about this, right? Where um, not every game, even as highly uh, rated as some games are, are just necessarily going to appeal to everybody, right? That's the way it works. So I respect that, man. I respect that. Uh, I've been, I've enjoyed quite a bit of, of Borderlands content. Yep. Shantae and the Pirate's Curse is free to keep on GOG. The retro style platformer is a nice palate cleanser. Uh, Shantae series has its origins on Nintendo consoles where its first game, simply called Shantae, debuted in 2002 for the Game Boy Color. Shantae has spawned five games all up with the most recent installments, Half Genie Hero and Shantae and the Seven Sirens, offering up some enjoyable, if at times overly orthodox, takes on the Metroidvania format. The third game in the series, Shantae and the Pirate's Curse, is currently free to keep on GOG. Go grab it, guys. Shantae and the Pirate's Curse first released for the 3DS back in 2014, and then a few months later for the Wii U. Since then, Shantae has broken her Nintendo exclusivity shackles and released for other consoles and PC, but this is a good place to start. It received favorable reviews at launch, and you can't argue with free. Exactly. Uh, free to play games, man. It's uh, or free to own games, uh, rather. Excuse me. Uh, free to own. Um, I promote it all the time. Even if you think you might not play it, why not just have it as part of your library just in case, right? It's the first Shantae game to move away from the retro style pixel art with a bright HD card. HD cartoon art style that will appeal to anyone with whose eyes water fondly at the sight of Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom. You really shouldn't play Shantae games for their storytelling prowess, but this one has the protagonist fighting a crime wave that has infected the normally tranquil environs of Sinquin Land. Uh, Shantae uses her ponytail to slaughter for her foes and can do a belly dance to turn into different forms. She's a half-genie, you know. 
the Shantae giveaway co coincides with GOG's summer sale, which is offloading a bunch of retro and modern games for heavily reduced prices. Uh, sale ends on June 27th, but Shantae will only be free for the next day and a half or until 6 a.m. Thursday morning. Uh, so yeah, if you're going to get it, go grab it quick. Uh, also, while I'm thinking about it, um, don't forget that Maneater is free on Epic right now. Until tomorrow, I think. Yeah, free until tomorrow morning. So roughly another day to grab Maneater for free. And then uh, Superland will be free. We're going to play Superland pretty soon, I think. Um, or when we, Whenever we find a break in schedule to play it. Um, Pinky's been promoting it for a while to me. And uh, I'd definitely be down to play it. Especially now that it's going to be free. Also, don't forget, the, uh, the Epic Cell ends tomorrow as well. So... Um, they've got all kinds of games, all kinds of DLC on, on sale. And if you've gotten free games previously over the past year that, uh, quite often they don't come with DLC right now might be the time to go look and see if that DLC is on sale. Cause it probably is. And you also get an extra 25% off right now. So if you've got free games that you're, you know, you'd rather play with the DLC right now might be the, the time to grab that DLC on Epic. I don't know. Just a thought. Just a thought. Uh, just your opinion. Yeah, for sure. Uh, tried it so much, but somewhere around the middle, I get uh, tired of the humor and the guns feel repetitive. I respect that, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, everything Everything for us is respective, right, to our own preferences and, and enjoyment of titles. So I get it, man. Yeah. And... Um, Again, it would not. It's absolutely not the first time we've ever had a uh, part of the community, uh, you know, have a game that is very well, you know, a series that's that's well loved and reviewed and just gone. Hey, it's not really my cup of tea, you know. So, yeah, I understand it, buddy. Yeah, for sure. So go go grab some uh, free games, guys. Free games. Uh, I don't know how you can really argue with that. Uh, not free to play, free to own. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess they are free to play if you own them, but you know what I mean. Uh, Gran Turismo pick from Neil Bloom, uh, Blomkamp gets Sony release date. New details. Oh, Sony has set an August 11th next year, 2023 release date for Gran Turismo, the video game adaptation from director Neil Blomkamp. And Columbia Pictures. Jason Hall wrote the screenplay and PlayStation Productions. As Asad Quizzlebash and Carter Swan serve as producers alongside Doug Bel Belgrad and Dana Brunetti. Based on a true story, the film is the ultimate wish fulfillment tale of a teenage Gran Turismo player whose gaming skills won a series of Nissan competitions to become an actual professional race car driver. Um, project is in very early development. We hear Neil Bloomkamp is being eyed to direct. The plot of the film project is being kept under wraps, but the news comes as rumors surface today that a TV, TV adaptation of the racing game is also being developed and aimed at a streaming service. Those rumors are not accurate, we hear. Okay. Yeah, I mean... Dude, they're turning like every game series <laughs> into a show or uh, like a movie or a TV show at this point, right? What I will say is uh, what it everything that I've read about what Gran Turismo has turned into from Sony is uh, pretty scummy and feels really bad. As far as having to pay to buy the game and then um, they want you to pay money to buy cars, especially special cars in the game. Um, and then people were... Um, trying to grind currency in the game to try to get those cars without having to pay money. And then uh, they went in and went, oh, well, this is too easy for you to, to grind currency. So we will uh, we'll go ahead and take that option away and, and uh, make it to where you basically would have to spend a massive amount of, in the time, of time in the game grinding currency uh, if you ever wanted to not pay money to get some uh, most of those cars. Um, 
Just another example of the scummy stuff that developers are doing to try to suck as much money as possible out of people, man. Feels bad. But we'll see what the uh, the show brings anyways. I'm reading that last. Uh, Photoshop goes free to paint on the web. It's only available in uh, Canada right now, but will hopefully expand soon. Photoshop, again, this isn't necessarily gaming news, right? But uh, for anybody that is a uh, digital artist or content creator, this is appropriate kind of content. So uh, Photoshop might finally be as accessible as its many alternatives. Adobe has made its existing web-based version of Photoshop free or, well, freemium in Canada. It will hopefully expand availability in the near future. Adobe VP of Digital Imaging Maria Yap didn't say when that will be, but Sid did say that she wants to see it, quote, meet users where they are at now in an interview with The Verge. Uh, to access it, you need to have a free Adobe account and use a link on that page, which you will only see if you're in Canada at the moment to open it. VPN? Maybe? <laughs> I don't know, dude. Uh, the web version of Photoshop isn't as robust as the software that costs you at least $10 a month uh, via their cloud subscription, but it has the features needed to be to do most simple tasks. You can use keyboard shortcuts, crop images, swap between layers, create masks, and adjustment layers, and use the head healing brush. Uh, crucially, you can't turn images into smart objects, which means you resize them multiple times. They won't maintain the correct resolution. Photoshop for the web can't really compare with some other popular free photo editing tools like Photo Photopea, GIMP, and Paint.net. Photopea, for example, has image filters, layer merging, and layer styles. It has uh, most of the Photoshop's big features and a near identical UI. Surprisingly, Photoshop on the web isn't as close to its desktop version, maybe as an attempt to make it more approachable for new users. The point of it is to get you to eventually pay for a Creative Cloud subscription. Yes, obviously or some other form of unannounced monetization to unlock more features. It's pretty uh, bare bones if you intend to use it for more than really basic editing, like creating memes or just quickly touching up images. Uh, this free to try format for Adobe apps isn't new. The company already has several apps that are free on mobile, including Adobe Premiere Rush, Adobe Fresco, and Adobe Express. <clears throat> Photoshop on the web is the first time one of its most popular pieces of software will be available this way, though, and it could be pretty useful if you don't have a powerful laptop or tablet. Um, yeah, there are a lot of actually uh, free to use uh, programs out there, whether it be a program or a site. Um, I can attest to using uh, Pixlr, uh, which is just a website that allows you to do uh, a decent amount of just editing. Uh, so there's a lot out there that you can find and use. Um, again, many of the free versions of things that you're going to get access to are not going to give you nearly the uh, utility of the tools that are presented in like a, a paid piece of software. But it just depends on what you need, right? What what fills the uh, the need for whatever you're trying to get done and, and move forward with. And um, a lot of it just has to do with doing your own research and finding out what is going to be the best for your own personal situation as far as uh, this kind of uh, application. So there you go. I mean, uh, there's some free Adobe Photoshop, a free tier of it potentially coming out anyway. So look into it if it's... Uh, Again, right now, only in Canada. So uh, it'll probably be pushed out uh, many other places before long, if I was to guess. Uh, Target's running a buy two, get one free deal for video games, guys. Uh, so is Amazon. I'm just going to go ahead and place this in... Uh, the deal appears to apply to all games sold through Target with even pricey collector's editions for games like Dying Light 2 and Marvel's Avengers included in the deal. Target is also featuring sales on several, several popular games alongside the bundle deal with uh, Mortal Kombat 11, It Takes Two, and Monster Hunter Rise, uh, seeing price reductions among others. Um, yeah, games aren't the only products included in the, the savings. The sales also extend to toys, movies, books, and a variety of board and card games as well. Same thing Amazon's doing right now. Um, 
I'm going to throw this in chat. If you're interested in getting some new uh, games, potentially other things, uh, it might be a good time. Amazon's doing the free, the same thing though, right? They're doing the same deal. Buy two, get one free. And not just video games, movies, toys, all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested, there's the link for the Target. I put the link yesterday for Amazon's that we came across, uh, it, you know, whenever we came across it yesterday in the news segment. But uh, just take a look at both sites if you're interested and potentially uh, going to be buying some things to see if you might be able to get a better deal from one of these sites in uh, getting taking advantage of the buy two get one free deal. Okay, there we go. Um, so Prime Gaming Ultimate Showdown is Amazon's biggest esports event yet. Uh, Amazon just announced that the Amazon Prime Gaming Ultimate Showdown this is going to be a fifty thousand dollar tournament bringing multiple titles together into a grand finale at TwitchCon this year. Based on scale and size, it's Amazon's biggest esports event to date. The Prime Gaming Ultimate Showdown will cover a lot of different games. It, it'll pull in everything from MMOs to FPS games to give an esports experience that spans everything gaming has to offer. Tournament will start with four pre-qualifying rounds. These will be held in Seattle, Amsterdam, Germany, and Japan. Qualifiers are going to be a global competition. Competitors will be getting prizes for competing, but the events will also raise money for charity. These rounds will secure the top five players a spot at the grand finale. The finale for the Ultimate Showdown is going to be held at TwitchCon in San Diego. This round will be held live, bringing together the fans, uh, the teams, excuse me, from around the world. Calendar, June 25th is the Seattle pre-qualifier. 16th through 17th uh, is Amsterdam's. Japan's is 15th through the 18th of September. And the grand finale at TwitchCon is October 7th through 9th. Um, don't have the full details yet of which games are going to be played at, at which event. However, each of the rounds will be broadcast on Twitch. There will also be uh, loot drops through the broadcast. Fans can win games and other gaming gear by watching the event. There you go. If you need more uh, info regarding that article, if you're interested, there it is. The Little League World Series is back in video games after 12 years. Arcade-style baseball game coming in August. An arcade uh, baseball game coming to consoles and PC this August will resurrect the Little League World Series as a licensed video game 12 years after the last time the youth tournament headlined in a box cover. Uh, developed by Iguana Bee, published by Game Mill Entertainment, will be available for um, Switch, PS4, 5, Windows, PC via Steam, Xbox One, and Xbox Series X. Players will take one of 20 fictional teams in a championship mode that includes a representation of Howard J. LeMade Stadium in South Williamsport, Pennsylvania, the site of Little League U.S. and World Series championship games. Uh, it will feature other fictional stadiums. Looks to be an arcade-style game with power-ups and bullet time slides and defensive plays emphasizing the action. Uh, players can customize their team's look, equipment, and batting style. Cool. Uh, is it already up here? No? I don't think. What was the name of it? Yeah. So it's not up on their site, on Steam site yet, but uh, there you go, guys. So you know. So you know. It is coming. It is coming. All right. Cool. Uh, what has happened to all the video games? As the industry braces itself for a quiet 2022 with more major games getting delayed, we ask developers about the challenges they are facing. First few months uh, of this year will were full of major releases. Elden Ring, Horizon, Gran Turismo, Dying Light. Pokemon uh, Legends, Arceus, yeah. And uh, although the slate beyond that was uncertain, there were some big titles due over the, the, uh, the year. The two biggest, Starfield and Legend of Zelda, are delayed. Yeah, both games have been delayed. The release schedule has dried up, and the majority of game reveals over the last month have been for titles due in 2023. It's not true to say that there is nothing coming out this year, but there's a little on a scale that 
There is little on a scale that media owners and retailers were hoping for. Uh, so what's going on? Um, any developer will tell you that they're witnessing the repercussions of COVID-19. Uh, yet with TV, the movie and TV industry continuing to, to deliver major releases, what is it about games that means we're still struggling some two years since the pandemic started? Hidden impact of remote working. Yes, uh, obviously. This is a long article, guys. I'm not going to read this whole thing. The cyberpunk warning. The quality drop is the biggest concern. Our Canadian developer observes, uh, quote, look at the games that didn't get delayed or when the teams weren't given more time. The best two examples I can think of is Battlefield 2042 and Call of Duty Vanguard. We've read recently uh, many reports coming out that EA is basically skeleton crewing uh, developers for Battlefield at this point and are trying to just go ahead and move on with the new iteration of that series. EA is refuting those claims, but uh, there are multiple reports coming out saying that Battlefield is basically just trying to follow through with the minimum amount of content moving forward for Battlefield 2042 to um, fulfill what they promised for the game from uh, pre and initial release, and they are ready to move on. Again, EA is refuting, so, but as far as I'm concerned, I'll probably believe other people overall believing anything that EA is going to shove at me, so I don't know. We'll see. Um, they came out on time, right? Same time they always do, but they disappointed. And that's not my opinion. That's the Metacritic score speaking. That's not right. These are some of the best game studios in the world, or they were at one point. Also, who makes Call of Duty? Activision. Activision Blizzard. Who makes Battlefield? Well, DICE and EA, right? Um, so, <laughs> say that these are some of the best game studios in the world. Uh, maybe at one point. I don't think they are anymore. Indeed, it is possible, as the likes of Battlefield and Call of Duty have proved, uh, you know what it is? I don't think it's, it's as much as them hating their own game as what I talk about quite often when it comes to these giant developers anymore is they have lost sight of what it means to bring us great content. Let me let me pull up a quote real quick, okay? Um, one second. This is a quote from another developer that I found here recently um, that I saved because it, it really, really captures exactly the way I feel about how most big developers go about developing games anymore, okay? Um, just a second, I'll pull this up. It's very simple, but it's very, very well stated, okay? I saved it because it was so, such a great thing to hear from another developer. Uh, they referencing, okay, like, um, Referencing any, I mean, insert whatever developer you want anymore that has gotten so large that they are just producing crap. They are companies that don't value games or game fans, gamers. And uh, what a very simply stated and very well put uh, quote and sentiment from Yuji Naka, okay, a, another developer. Um, this is a developer that apparently is uh, from everything that I can have found out about uh, is very passionate about developing games and has had to deal with working for large developers that um, basically wouldn't afford them more time to uh, work on games that needed further development. And instead was like, we'll just push it out. Right. And that's what we see quite often from developers anymore. Um, especially mainly these big developers. They have lost sight what it means to create good content. 
create good games and create good content for us as the people that are the consumers of the world we love, which is video games, right? And I don't, I don't think it's necessarily anything about them just hating their own games as much as it is they just don't care. They don't care about creating good content anymore. And they have gotten into this groove of just relying on the fact that they can fall or lean on these very, very popular titles they have, whether it be Square Enix with Final Fantasy, which Square Enix, I think, is still producing quality Final Fantasy uh, content. But Square Enix has fallen off on a lot of their other titles and stuff like that, as far as I'm concerned. And, um, you know, I mean, you, you can find all kinds of examples, you know what I mean, um, where these they've gotten so big that they just don't produce anything worth crap anymore. And it's just leaning on these titles that they know have a good fan base and, and will continue to make money because people just buy it, you know? Um... <clears throat> There you go, Fat Pat. Yep. Yep. And, I mean, ultimately, what it would take for us to uh, change this is to have a united front as a community of gamers and say, we're not going to support this anymore. I talked about this yesterday. I will not play another uh, Blizzard game. I will not play another Blizzard game. I don't care if it's free to play. I don't care. Because, again, just because you're not paying money to a company doesn't mean you're not supporting that company by by adding to their current player base. Numbers matter, right? And um, I'm at the point with Blizzard, Activision Blizzard, and Blizzard was one of my all-time favorite devs for a very long time. I grew up on StarCraft and WarCraft and World of WarCraft and uh, Diablo 1 and 2. Like, I loved that developer. And I won't support them in any form or fashion anymore. I won't do it. I can't. Uh, it's just gotten too bad. Everything about the scummy crap they incorporate in their games uh, to the horrible uh, environment that they have cultivated throughout that business. Um, super toxic. Biased. Bigotry. I mean, you name it. It's terrible. And I just won't do it anymore. Other people will. And I think that it's not necessarily, again, I talked about this yesterday too, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are trying to support that company as much as just being lovers of video games. But for me, being passionate the way I am about the industry and and uh, games, and I, I can't in good conscience uh, be anything that has anything to do with those, them anymore. Uh, are they pedos? I don't know, dude. Are they? I don't know that I've, uh, are they? Have they been, uh, accused of, of doing that stuff too? Yeah, at this point, I wouldn't even be surprised. I mean, if you're actually, okay. <laughs> I don't know, I couldn't tell if you were like giving me a real question there. Or if you're like, <laughs> There wasn't any Kappa in there or anything either, you know? Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, they have been accused of such a wide variety of just really, really terrible uh, work environment stuff, you know? Massage, you know, uh, late Kappa. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. It, 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 to, to me, the way I see a lot of these big corporations is, they don't care about what they're creating anymore, the quality of it. Uh, ultimately, it's just, no, you're good, Psych. You're good, dude. It, it's just uh, the fact that they know they can lean on uh, these popular titles that they have, right? Um, and it'll continue to make them money. It feels bad. It feels terrible. Um, indeed, it is possible, as the likes of Battlefield and Call of Duty have proved, to still hit your schedules and get your game out. But publishers and developers are, broadly speaking, less willing to release a title that isn't ready. Uh, quote, we took one look at what happened to Cyberpunk 2077 and thought, yep, we're delaying this, says a U.S. game director from one of the world's biggest game franchises. Uh, CD Projekt is one of the most respected game studios in the world. They released a game so broken that Sony 
pulled it from their own digital store. That's unprecedented. That's humiliating. We knew our game wasn't in the best shape. Maybe we could patch it up with a day one update, but we saw Cyberpunk and decided it wasn't worth the risk. I suspect that was a wake-up call across the industry. Uh, we would hope. It's a little easier to delay a game these days. Uh, one senior executive at a big Japanese publisher exclaimed, uh, explains, There was a time when delaying a game could be a disaster, particularly if you're shifting it out of a financial year. Today, it's not the ideal. It's not ideal. It still hurts, but we'll live. We've got this digital business ticking uh, things over on Steam. We've got re uh, recurrent revenue coming in through live service games. And during the pandemic, that stuff has been doing better than ever. It may have been due to the pandemic that these games need delaying, but not necessarily. Our U.S. Uh, game director explains that the industry is going through a momentous technological shift. Uh, in my 20 years, quote, In my 20 years, I've never known anything like it, he tells us. Cloud technologies, new engines, new consoles, cross-platform play. You've got games with hundreds of players playing across devices with different internet speeds in different countries. Uh, planning and predicting that, no matter how good you are, is hard. Throw in a pandemic, it isn't any surprise games are coming out in fits and starts. Is it any surprise games are coming out in fits and starts? Uh, indeed, remote working may be a major contributor to the state of things, but there are other factors at play. Finding a way forward. Is there an end to this in sight? 96% of participants in the U.S. Best Places to Work Awards last month told us that they had no intention of making their staff return to the office full-time. Developers in this article admit, quote, the genie is out of the bottle. The idea of going back to work to commute every day and only hiring people who are willing to move to the area is a no-starter. Uh, quote, it is better for individuals' lifestyles. It also allows for collaboration on a much broader geographical basis than previously. Uh, I said all the things I said above because we need to get to the other side of it. We need to know how to master these things. It's not like the problem is going to go away. Uh, Holtberg adds, we need to embrace what came out of this and see how we can best create working environments that fit the devs and the projects. That is bound to be different, both between workplaces, but maybe even within the time frame of a certain project. Yeah. Bala concludes, quote, there are a variety of solutions that people are offering now and we're trying some of them. There is a mix of on-site events, opportunities to meet in person, face-to-face -face interactions to com complement remote. We're all on a journey here to find a more sustainable model because the idea that everything exists in a virtual space without human contact, it's not really how we are as humans. I don't think we want that. Um, look, I mean, I, I, I think we've definitely, you know, come to the consensus you know, within this community for sure. And I think across the gaming community as a whole that we would much rather see a developer delay a game than, you know, present us with another cyberpunk, no man's sky, you know, situation. It's, uh, I mean, that's just a couple of examples of, uh, Anthem. I mean, you name it. There are all kinds of examples out there of games that, never or, or or you know at least upon release did not even come close to following through with uh what was promised and were just hot messes you know and for us as as gaming enthusiasts we feel duped when that happens and it has gotten us to a point where we just we don't feel like we can be hyped about games anymore um we're very, very reluctant to try a game on release because it's just, it's happened to us too many times. And, uh, we just, we don't want to, we don't want to feel that way anymore, you know? And I don't know. It, it's again, a lot of what it's going to take for these larger industries to have a hard look at how much, how terrible it is for us as the consumer and gaming uh, games lovers of, of video games. It, it would take a united front, basically. People have to quit supporting. And that's a hard thing to, to make happen. So, I don't know. But at least it sounds like, to an extent, some people are understanding what it, uh, you know, it means to go ahead and delay their game and bring quality product to the table rather than, you know, pushing things out fast and just letting everybody down, you know.
We need more of that thought process from developers across the industry, for sure. Um, Silent Hill movie director says video game reboot is happening. This isn't necessarily uh, new news. We knew this was kind of happening, but uh, just another confirmation, really. The director behind the 2006 Silent Hill movie has said that Konami is very much in the process of rebooting its dormant survival horror franchise. For a prolonged period of time, rumors and reports have continued to circle, suggesting that a new era of Silent Hill is about to kick off. And while none of this speculation has resulted in any actual announcements from Konami, it sounds like this silence will be coming to an end before long. In a recent conversation with uh, Zhu Aktu, uh, did I butcher that? I'm sure I did. Sai, uh, Christoph Gans, uh, who directed the film adaptation of Silent Hill over 15 years ago, said in a very definitive manner that Konami is in the process of bringing the video game series back. I always... Yeah, and I mean, we hit on that yesterday too, right? Like, you know, yeah, but not too badly. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I always, <laughs> I always lean on Psych because Psych is is very versed in different languages and, uh, you know, is not hesitant about letting me know how bad I am at pronouncing <laughs> words. So I always lean on Psych. Uh, yo, just a second. We've gotten... Uh, We've got us. We've got us a potential bot, guys. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Get banned. Everybody, say bye to the bot. Bye, bye, bot. See ya. Bye. All right. Um. People are <laughs> pinky. People are already not supporting them, leading to them complaining about pirating on the rise. Yeah. I mean, and again, I hit on that big yesterday. So if you guys want to get my take on pirating we we had a really nice segment that i kind of gave my view we read an article that wasn't really addressing why pirating has become such a problem uh around video gaming uh enter entertainment video gaming in specific um and i took the time to kind of flesh out some other reasons why pirating it has become such an issue and i think a a good chunk of the responsibility of that falls on developers uh, making people feel scammed too much. I do. Um, <laughs> we only have one bot here. Yo, random mode time, guys. Let's go. Looking for that too spicy emote. Let's go, guys. Try to get that, that free sub. Um, Christopher Gans, who directed the film adaptation of Silent Hill over 15 years ago. Yo, I love the original Silent Hill movie, by the way. I thought it was really good. The sequel sucked, but the original was really good. I liked it. Uh, said in a definitive manner that Konami is in the process of bringing the video game series back. Gans acknowledged that some fans have picked up on the leaks and rumors associated with this revival, and he confirmed that, to his knowledge, this is all accurate. He also talked about how a new movie associated with Silent Hill is part of this reboot plan as well. All right, cool. Quote, the franchise is going to be relaunched in terms of video games and therefore the film will become part of a global policy. Gans, uh, or Gans said in the conversation, quote, I believe that on a forum someone deduced that and he is absolutely right. In, in other words, the film is indeed part of a whole. Nice sight. Uh, he also went on to say that part of the reason why Konami may have felt prompted to return to Silent Hill at this point in time is due to the success of Capcom's recent Resident Evil remakes. I work with Konami. Konami's uh, are all about it. And I think they've been galvanized by the success of RE2 and 3 reboots, which are marvelous games. And we uh, just saw announced RE4 is coming, uh, remake is coming as well, right? Uh, when the Silent Hill revival might actually come about remains to be seen, but given how much the franchise has been in the headlines lately, it seems like Konami might have something to announce in the coming months. Assuming that such news does not end up coming about, We'll be sure to update you here on comicbook.com. Yeah, I mean, this is not... We've, we've seen other confirmations and leaks and stuff about Silent Hill basically being, like, unofficially confirmed as a uh, being remade. This is just another instance of that, so let's go. 
Uh, PS Plus revamp gives you a ton of games, which I linked earlier in uh, the news segment. There was a whole list. Well, I linked yesterday the 700 games coming to the platform, the subscription service. I linked earlier today the 200 being taken away, okay? Um, but is a bit of a mess. Sony's big revamp of PS Plus is here. It's pretty cool. It could also use some work on some of its most hyped perks, such as game demos and classic hits. Announced back in March, PS Plus 2.0, not the official name, but definitely the easiest shorthand, is a rework of Sony's desperate subscription services. Fundamentally, it combines the game streaming of PS Now with a litany of perks from PS Plus. Though PS Plus 2.0 has been available in various markets for a few weeks, it rolled out stateside yesterday. Um... The pricing model is needlessly confusing. There are three different tiers. Um, we've already kind of talked about this. Short version, $10 a month gets you PS Plus Essential. More or less exactly what PS Plus was two days ago. $15 a month gets you PS Plus Extra, including a Netflix-style games-on-demand library with hundreds of PS4 and PS5 titles. And $18 a month, they have yearly fees that, which uh, you can play, pay up front for the entire year, which are a little bit less overall. Um, but $18 a month gets you the premium tier, adding the ability to stream games and check out time-limited game demos, plus access to a bunch of classic vintage like retro games from their previous like console gens. Okay. Um, now that PS Plus 2.0 is here, still confusing. Sony says it offered prorated pricing for upgrades to higher tiers for people with existing PS Plus memberships. You can upgrade right from the PS Plus dashboard on your PS5. In fact, it's the very first button. Game trials leave a lot to be desired. There you go, Metal. Nice, dude. You and Pinky right there. Look at you guys. Almost got the same one. Uh, the launch day list of demos includes just two first-party games, one of which is a remastered bundle of two games that are otherwise available in full as part of the PS Plus Extra Game Library. Uh, here's the full list of game demos. Backward compatibility offerings are thin. Another big selling point of PS Plus Premium Tier is its access to games from older PS consoles. While more than 300 PlayStation 3 games are available to stream, that's the thing. They're only available to stream. Sony recommends a minimum, minimum connection of 5... Uh, megabits per second you can also download and stream hundreds of playstation games from every other gen including ps4 and ps5 resolution tops out at 720p according to ars technica's testing though sony says it can go up to 1080p depending on your connection that's to say nothing in the latency however subtle that tends to play game streaming it's a shame the rich ps3 catalog isn't downloadable sony also didn't make the full list of ps3 games uh easy to find Click on Classic Games under the Explore submenu. You get taken to the full list of games from the joint PlayStation PS2 PS Portable catalog, which we'll get to in a sec. If you scroll down to All New PlayStation Plus Benefits, click on the Classics cl catalog banner. You'll get taken to a second splash screen. The PS3 games are listed on the second row. Good night. Scrolling all the way through to the right will bring you to a Show All Games option. Wow. You can search for the exact game you want to play, if you know it's part of the game library. Once you stream a game, it'll show up on your home screen, which is nice. The PS5 currently limits that list to 10 icons, though. Uh, ton of potential, but it definitely looks like it has issues, man. Uh, oh, you got the same ones before. Did that happen to me yesterday, I think, as well? Uh, that's kind of wild. So... Like, I'll put this article in here if you guys want to take a, an extended look at some of the issues. This is not unheard of, right? Now, I can tell you, like, there's something to be said for having a really nice platform for a streaming service that uh, feels very intuitive to the user. Uh, very easy to find anything that you might be lo looking for. Um, and flows just very well. On the flip side of that, it feels absolutely terrible to be trying to navigate your way through a uh, a platform such as uh, a game streaming service or 
a uh, video movie streaming service, whatever. Uh, it feels feels so bad whenever it is a platform that is not developed in a very intuitive way. Um, I recently started trying out a uh, subscription to Apple TV. It is horrid. Their platform is terrible. It feels so, so bad. They've got some cool shows on there, but just navigating through things <clears throat> does not feel very good. It, it, it is honestly one of the worst developed platforms for um, a TV movie streaming uh, service that I have ever experienced. Not to mention the fact that Apple is so up their own butts about not giving access to apps on like you actually if you're on like any kind of um apple or not apple uh uh android device you can't download an app for their streaming service you have to run it through a browser on a an android device <laughs> I, I don't understand their their thought process behind that when they want people to be buying into the subscription service, but they're not going to allow you to use an app on an Android device to access it. It's 2022, Apple. I'll get off the Apple rant. But just ultimately, any kind of platform that is a streaming service or uh, gives you access to uh, forms of entertainment or whatever, it feels very bad to try to navigate through those kinds of, of uh platforms that aren't developed very well just across the board it feels great when when it's developed very well it feels horrible when it's not um i linked to that in chat if you guys want to take a look at the rest of that okay um this will be the last article unless anybody has anything to share again i know the new segments have been long right now if you pay for it <laughs> Yo, that'd be wild, by the way. That'd be a... I mean, not that Ferraris are heavier or anything, but I guarantee your Fiat is a lot less uh, weight than a Ferrari is. <laughs> I, I know you're memeing out right now a little bit, but in all actuality, putting a very high-powered high, uh, engine into a really light car, a little small car like that would be wild. You'd have to put a willy bar on the back, dude. Oh, for real? Sick, dude. That's awesome. Awesome. You know, that's one of the, you know, not trying to get off track here, but, you know, one of the ugliest Mustangs ever made were these, uh, what were they, early 90s Mustangs? These Mustangs, some of the ugliest Mustangs ever made. But they are legit. Double mean me, yeah. Uh, they are legit. Some, I mean, just because I got on this topic. Uh, what is an a, a Barth car, dude? I don't even know what that is. I'll look it up. Um, so double mean me without me knowing it. Anyways, these cars are ugly. Ugh. I hate the new Mustang, by the way. The new Mustang looks like it's trying to be some kind of European sports car, not a muscle car. Uh, this Mustang is ugly, but it is legit one of the fastest Mustangs that is made because of how light the car is. Um, so it's really like this weird situation where it's like a terribly ugly version of the Mustang, but it actually can be built to be very, very, very fast. Kind of wild. Yo, get off. Yeah, Fat Pat. Yep, yep. Made out of Tupperware? Topperware. What's Topperware, dude? What is that? <laughs> Is that how it's spelled? I thought it was T-U-P-P. Tupperware. Is it Topper? Am I the one that's dumb? I mean, we know I'm three-head. Let's be real. 
Or was it just a misspell there? What is this, dude? What is this, bro? <laughs> it's a rally. F dude, look at this. <laughs> what? Dude, it almost look these almost look like uh Well, what's funny uh side bringing that up, a lot of people think that uh it's actually pronounced tubberware because it's like a tub, but it's not. It's it's tupper is it But I think it's T U. Yeah, tupperware. Yep. Yeah. What is it? Looks like it looks like America's or, or not America. I mean, it's uh like Volkswagen Bug, dude. Tupperware, yeah, for tubby people, huh? That's my kind of Tupperware. Tubby wear. <laughs> All right, we'll keep moving on. Look, last uh last news segment. Okay, news article. Uh, not last news segment. We got many more news segments to come in the following days. Um, years, decades. Centuries. It's not wild to think that I could live to be 182 years old with technology these days. Anyways, um, if you have anything else that you want to bring up for the news segment, talk about that maybe we didn't hit on, let me know in chat. And I'm going to go ahead and finish this one up, okay? Again, I know news segments have been kind of long here recently, but a lot of it has to do with how much uh, we've been getting the, the past week and a half in regards to just gaming in general, okay? Because of all the showcases and everything, so... We've had some that are still normal, but we've been going long on some of these too. So it's good news though. The importance of gaming news websites. The world is becoming digital and every industry will require digitization. Gaming news websites play an important role in teaching and informing the general public about current events worldwide. People have less time for themselves, not enough uh, not enough to read the printed newspaper to catch up on what happened yesterday, so they rely on web portals or electronic media to keep up with the current news. The game world and the real world are a part, but neither would exist without the other. It's just as vital to keep up with the virtual universe as it is with reality, since they complement one another in a way that can be beneficial if you're keeping track of high-quality, trustworthy news. Um, that is a huge, huge statement right there. All right. Um, trustworthy news. News that has not been taken out of context or altered to fit whatever, uh, you know, agency or, or business uh, that is reporting that news to fit their agenda. Right. Uh, we talk about that quite often in here as well. You'll need to ensure that you have a link to the best informational resources available, and GamingSpace.com is just the right platform for all games news, reviews, and many other gaming activities. So this is a promotional kind of thing, huh? A little bit there. Uh, giving out information on sport. Gaming news websites offer various sports information to the target viewers or audience on different aspects of sports. Uh, that's not the kind of gaming we're talking about. Okay. Sports news. This is all about sports. This is not what we're talking about. But. This uh, paragraph actually falls in line with you know, what we do here in regards to video gaming news. Uh, I, I don't know that neither would exist without the other, but uh, to that, you know, that statement there, video games uh, have become a huge part of what, you know, the world is at this point. That's why the market is so lucrative and, Everybody wants to become part of it. Um, obviously, uh, I'll get out of this one because that's that's a weird article. It didn't provide what I was thinking it was going to provide. But, you know, that's why we do the news every day in here. We are all passionate. We are all people that are passionate about gaming. We love what gaming is and represents for 
uh, us individually, as, as well as, uh, you know, the world, you know, community of gamers and everything. And, and so staying up to date with everything that happens in the news has become something that's very, very important to me. And, and uh, I think to most of the rest of the community as well, which is why we have started doing these dedicated news segments. And um, I will continue to do them because uh, not only do I feel it's important, but I, I very, very much enjoy uh, fleshing out some of these top topics uh, amongst our community. So uh, on that note, I will say thank you to everybody that is always part of what we do here in this channel and community as a whole, but also thanks to everybody who's part of the news segments all the time. Thank you, guys. Um, we're going to move on to a little bit of looking at what everything I wish listed uh, regarding the showcases before we move on to uh, Valheim play for the rest of the day. But if you are catching this new segment as a VOD on YouTube later, then uh, consider hitting that like and subscribe button. Maybe leave me a comment if you would like to have a bit of a discussion regarding some of these topics we went over today, okay? Uh, other than that, see what you can do about coming and hanging out with us every morning at 6 o'clock uh, a.m. CST, where we do the new segment live at the beginning of every single stream every single day, okay? Other than that, Everybody just uh, stay healthy, stay safe, be kind, and we'll catch everybody tomorrow morning for our June 16th edition of Video Gaming News. All right?